Welcome back, theater design students. This is Professor Emily Seal from Motlow State Community College here to talk to you about set design. Now we are going to move at a very fast pace and the scope of our conversation today will be huge talking about all um, scenic design. But today we're going to put the intro <laughs> into the intro to theater design class. You will see from chapters seven, eight, and nine that there are lots and lots of details that could be involved in ground plans, lots of details that could be involved in set design. And we are going to paint with a broad stroke, forgive the pun. Uh, so um, if you, as you do your ground plan, as you do your set model, uh, white model and fully realized model. If you want to take it further and follow more of the directions in the script, you are welcome to it. I'm just going to require of you, though, sort of the minimal, um, the minimum of what people would expect. So, uh, so a ground plan. A ground plan, if you've ever bought an actor's edition of a play, in the back there's quite often a ground plan. So this is Plaza Suite by the great Neil Simon. So if you have a um, piano lesson that you bought or uh, for your intro level class, I think there is also a ground plan in the back of that. And now this is recorded by the stage manager in order to help the director and the actors uh, know whereabouts kind of as they visualize the story acting out. Uh, so this is what we want from you for that first assignment is just sort of a rudimentary uh, spacing. Now notice the importance of where the proscenium is, right? Kind of where is all of this arranged in terms of the theater that we have? So for your assignment, I'm gonna ask that you use Powers Auditorium in uh, Oaf Hall in the Moore County campus of Motlow College. Part of what a ground plan does is it's a tool right? And so we have to put that tool into a context. Uh, if you've never visited Powers Auditorium and it's not a global pandemic, I would invite you in and welcome you to come and walk around. But I'll show some pictures of Powers Auditorium and our particular strengths and weaknesses as we go through the lesson today. So looking at the physical structure of your stage is sort of where we start. So here is my ground plan that I've created for Much Ado About Nothing. Uh, you can see um, I've got the proscenium marked here, right? And you, we have this strange sort of ramp at Powers Auditorium. I have that notated and a big lip of the stage. Now for the most part for this production, I've left that lip empty. Why is that? Uh, there was a lot of combat in this production, there was a lot of dance, a lot going on down here that I needed to just be usable space, right? But over here we have a two level, which I've marked there with the eight foot sign, and a backstage staircase, one that's not viewable to the audience. Upstairs we have a balcony with rails, and down below we have an entrance door in and out. On the second level, we have this door here and a window, as we talk about in a midsummer, uh, not midsummer, sorry, much ado about nothing, the window. Over here, we have a outdoor garden pergola there uh, that the wedding happens underneath. Now there are pieces that come in and out that I haven't included here. We have, during the wedding scene, uh, we have some poles decorated with flowers. Uh, during the dance sequence, we took these chairs and tables off. So um, I'm just asking you to create one ground plan for your portfolio project. Uh, if I were feeling ambitious and I wanted to create multiple ground plans for multiple scenes, of course, that's gonna look great when you use this portfolio um, for scholarship opportunities. So. Um, over here we have the narrator's corner and a little couch stuck in there for our internal uh, scenes with the villains. So you can see it's readable, it's clean, it's not anything I'm going to mount and hang on my wall as a thing of beauty, uh, but it's a tool, it's functional, right? I haven't included a lot of dimensions. Right, I didn't say exactly how big this platform is. For example, uh, how much dimensions you include is up to you. 
uh, the main thing is that it be clean and usable for your directors and actors. So here's an example from um, C. Otis Sweezy at Vassar College. He's done Miss Julie, which is a very famous Strindberg play. You can see he has a very clean cut line there in the middle. Um, which makes it a different kind of drawing, a cut line, ground plan. Uh, you or not have to put that ground plan in. But we see three different levels here. We see the ground plan, the white model, and then the actual utilized set. And so you can see that this is only a glance at what this fully realized production uh, c comes to be. So on page 115, we have the term draw to scale. So part of the reason that you need this architectural template is not necessarily um, because you're going to be an architect, of course, but that it has a very useful tool, which is it's already creating the scale that we need. So at the, yeah, I was looking at it, the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see this the scale says one quarter inch to one foot. So when I use those doors, door swings that are created here, kind of hard to see, they're grainy there, but when I use these door swings, those are actual sizes of doors that I can go to Lowe's and buy already in the right size. So that really helps us to start to frame proportions, right? And figure out, okay, if I'm gonna put a door on the stage in Powers Auditorium, I can put this small of a door that I buy from Lowe's or this big of a door that I buy from Lowe's because these are the standard door sizes. Obviously, we're not putting any toilets on set, but if we needed to, <laughs> we would have the standard toilet size, um, right? And we also have a lovely ruler on one side and some circles to create those um, tables and chairs and things, uh, you can just trace those insides to mimic the furniture and platforms you need um, out of this architectural template. So I think they're worth every penny, uh, especially when it comes to helping you figure out their proportions. Because remember, our model is not just a dollhouse, something fun to play with. It's a tool to help us understand uh, how much we can fit onto this stage, how much we can fit in the wings, how much um, utilization, how we can rearrange this furniture without picking up the furniture and actually rearranging it, right? So another thing that I've asked you to get is a compass, right? Part of that I've included is a um, sort of like a croquis. Remember I had you, you could just uh, trace the body forms for the costume. I have sort of the same thing of Oaf Hall here for you. You can take this compass and trace the lip of the stage here, my approximation of it, and that'll help to give you that nice clean line, right, if you do that with a compass, rather than trying to sketch it out or trace it uh, in a different way. So that clean apron line that we want there. Now, most renderings, you'll see a less dramatic apron. A lot of the renderings you'll see is just, you know, enough room for maybe one person on the apron. Remember, our apron is almost a three-quarter thrust. We used to have stairs around a kind of normal-sized apron, and then we built that out. So we have almost a thrust stage through our adaptations of this space. We also put in that ramp to make it handicap accessible and uh, or handicap capable accessible, uh, then that um, ramp helps us. We can use that wonderfully for staging, but it also kind of has this funky renovated element to it that a regular theater might not have. So um, using that compass to get a nice clean line around the edge of your ground plan is, is why it's been required. So as you create notations on your ground plan, you want to write in uppercase letters, nice, clean writing, very, um, you know, no time to rush through and use your worst handwriting. Please write neatly and cleanly in nice um, 
strong lines that we can all read. Now in the textbook they talk about the different types of lines, you know, um, bold lines and thin lines, and you can do all of that in AutoCAD software. Uh, and you can also do that through just how, you know, darkly you write and how thinly you write your line. Um, but of course, for the purposes of our assignment, we're just going to keep it simple and clean and um, notate anything with our lines that we need to. So if you're tempted to get creative with it, I just want to remind you that one thing that's non-negotiable is that the apron um, be at the bottom of the paper. So the orientation of the ground plan. So you can see my orientation here where the aprons at the bottom, right? You need to do that same thing um, because uh, that's standard that the house be out here for a proscenium or a three quarter thrust and then the back of the stage be at the top, right? Here we go upstage working our way downstage. And so that's industry standard, so you don't want to break that quote-unquote rule. So then we have a title block, which is at the bottom. You can see because of the ramp, I put my title block in the bottom left-hand corner, but you can put it in the bottom right-hand corner if you're not utilizing this space over here, which you are not by any means required to do. So you can see here, they have dated theirs. You can date yours. Part of the reason that I didn't always date um, my costume renderings is because uh, I didn't want to tell on myself about you know, how long ago it was, but that's sort of dishonest, isn't it? So you should probably put a date on yours. <laughs> uh, but there are lots and lots of things that can be included in that title block. You um, can include lots and lots of information if it's a complicated, but for the purposes of our class, I would just include Motlo, uh, you know, your name as the designer at the very bottom, include the scale uh, for sure, and then the name of the production you're working on, which in this case is Much Ado About Nothing, right? You don't necessarily have to write that it's a ground plan in that, in that spot because it's no... Um, not, it couldn't be anything else, right? So, all right, so that's a little bit about the mechanics in Chapter 7 that we've been talking about and just creating a ground plan. Hopefully that's clear. Um, once again, if you Google ground plan, you can end up as roadkill on the information highway. There's lots and lots of information from the perspective of art architects and others. I've tried to include some ground plan examples um, in the class there for you to see some good examples. Um, but what I'm looking for is just the simple, almost what a stage manager would uh, give you to do acting and blocking for a director. I'm not looking for tons and tons of information. I just want a simple, um, rough outline of what you're wanting to do there. So let's talk a little bit about designing in general. Now, of course, we've already had a whole lecture on color. We've already had a whole lecture on um, the principles of design. So we've already sort of touched on a lot of this stuff. Uh, but just a few quick reminders as you think about creating your set model and your set design. Um, it should reflect the mood of the play, right? So this is a fight sequence in Babes in Toyland. And you can see uh, David Kircher here was the lighting designer also, and he's created these beautiful splashes of color to help uh, denote this sort of mayhem that's going on uh, right now in the in the play itself. Uh, but designs should express mood, right? This is Crybaby over here, which was a crazy fun farce. Uh, there's a movie version with Johnny Depp, um, written and directed by John Waters. And uh, you can see kind of how crazy the show is with the colors that Kurt chose to create for the backdrop. Right, so design helps set the mood. It's expressive. It helps us understand the story, even when we can't hear every word, right? And um, it should evoke a certain kind of emotion, whether it be um, that it's um, affecting you to be romantic or scary or all those things that we talked about in the second chapter, uh, in the third and fourth chapter. Uh, design, it's 
easy to get lost in the weeds. We still need to go back to that basic that it's going to evoke an emotion for you. So when you sit down to read Much Ado About Nothing, what evo emotions does it evoke for you? What feelings do you get from the script? What colors do you see? All that same work that we did when we talked about collages. Um, don't lose sight of that when you go to create the set. And you can work in abstraction. That's part of the reason why I picked a Shakespeare is because Shakespeare does the the hard work of saying, oh, here we are in fair Verona, <laughs> right? Uh, it, it, he lays out. So you don't necessarily have to paint a full picture with the set design because Shakespeare goes out of his way to use the words to paint the scene. So you can go more abstract with it and base it on how the play makes you feel or what you want to evoke for your audience. So this is Crybaby again. Kurt created uh, this really cool sort of, uh, there's this, um, in, in the story, they go to the lake in this kind of um, party venue that they've created, sort of a clubhouse feel. And so Kurt had a pool table here with some pool cues and some uh, type of signage that you would see at a bar or at a venue like this that's very casual and low class, <laughs> which I think is great. Um, and it sets the mood for a party, right? When you've got twinkle lights, when you've got, um, you know, Applebee's style junk on the walls. It creates this mood of, okay, we're here to party. We're here to get dangerous and have a little fun. So it's set in the 1950s, which is part of the reason that so much of the set is just made out of bricks because it sets that period up and uh, tells that story and lots of clean line architecture like we had in the 50s, right? These nice thick borders that create a clean line. Um, you know, you as the scenic designer, you want to have a specific location in mind um, and whether that location, if we're dealing with Shakespeare, is Verona or some imaginary place like Illyria that Shakespeare created, um, you know, even, and we talked about this in former lectures, so I won't bear on it, but even if it's science fiction, you want to create that land for yourself in the specific location. Right? How does socioeconomic level affect the scenery? Hugely, right? Um, part of the reason that this looks sort of junky is because uh, in Crybaby we have the low class characters and the upper class characters. Uh, she, this character is very upper class, this character is very low class, but this is their hangout, right? The low class characters are hanging out in their hangout. So they're going to have messy signs that don't match. and and uh, pool tables and twinkle lights and sort of a more trashy feel than if we were going to the country club, which is where we first meet Allison, right, is in the country club. So it's a summertime show. That's why we've got the sleeves rolled up and the shoulders uh, bare and exposed. We don't have a clear season outlined in Much Ado About Nothing, so you can set the time of year based on what you envision and what story you want to tell. <laughs> All right, uh, so as a director, uh, I created a ground plan here just to help me sort of remember, okay, where are the battens in relation to the concert curtain, in relation to the grand drape, because, okay, for example, when we're dealing with Crybaby, I had a scene that I needed to conceal all of the scenery. So I take this first batten and drop a drop there, then I can put all of those carriages back behind that first batten. So you get into the nitty gritties of saying, okay, I don't have any wing space in Oaf Hall to speak of. Of course, on this side, there's just enough for seriously people to walk past. I can maybe affect one carriage, one four by eight platform back here, like we did for Midsummer Night's Dream. But practically speaking, there is no wing space in Oaf Hall. So if you have, you know, if you're going to create multiple ground plans and create all of these elaborate sets, I guess they're going to have to be stored in the yard because <laughs> we have no wing space. Uh, so what do I as a director 
need from Kurt when we're designing Crybaby. Um, you know, I say to him, we have, this is a big musical. We've got lots and lots of locations. I need you to help take me to a different place relatively quickly with these scene changes. And so his solution to that was uh, rotating um, periactoids, rotating uh uh, platforms with that look like different scenery every time you rotate it and I needed that to happen relatively quickly so we put it all on casters. What do the actors need? They need lots and lots of places to sing and dance and act uh, in a large numbers because it's a big musical even though we have a small hall so a lot of the scenery kind of stays in the background for Crybaby and there's lots of room down here for dancing and fighting etc etc. Um, so what are the construction demands? This is something we're constantly facing in Powers Auditorium because uh, it's usually either me and Kurt or just me. Maybe a few students can help me um, that semester with Power Tools, but it, we can't dream up elaborate sets unless we're working on it all through the summer or we're willing to come in on during Christmas break and help build. So you know, when you're designing your design, you don't necessarily have to think that practically. You can have fun with it. This is a hypothetical. Um, but, you know, when I went to a big state school, when possibly you go on to a big state school like MTSU, you have lots of students taking practicum, lots of hands on deck to help with the construction. And that can really be a blessing because uh, you can spend all that time where you would have spent money working on the construction of the set. Uh, and we already belabored the time money budget uh, discussion earlier, but that is something to take into consideration is if as a set designer, what budget are you working with? What materials are available to you? You know, part of what's so fun about set design is as new technologies come along, uh, you can create new conventions in set design. You know, when we look at a show like Dear Evan Hansen, uh, the use of projections and screens uh, just revolutionized what I would have thought of as a traditional set design. Um, and this happens over and over again in set design that we have new available lighting, for example. So you saw in that first ground plan, Neil Simon play had foots attached, footlights there at the base of the actor's feet. Uh, we no longer have to worry about that because we have better lighting instruments that don't have to be something that actors can trip over, right? So what is available that we can utilize and we can use to plan to create these effects? And, uh, you know, projections are becoming more and more part of the conversation as technology advances, which is really exciting. Here's what I was trying to say about periactoi or a periactos if you just have one. So you have, um, for the set of Crybaby, you, you have a scenery on this side is the jail, and this side is the picnic outside, and this side um, is uh, just a plain brick wall for us to use in virtual settings. So as we rotate, and we actually had three things on wheels, but two of them were periactoids. Now, periactoid assumes that it's a triangle shape. Ours were actually full squares, but um, it's a very common device, especially for theaters like mine, where there's not a lot of wing space, right? So this goes back, the reason it's page 39 is it goes all the way back to Roman times, and um, they had these sort of three genres, it's not important necessarily for our discussion today, but um, periactoids are a great space saver. And so if you are looking to do lots and lots of locations, which you are welcome to do for Much Ado About Nothing, it can be a unit set, or you can make sure, you know, you can do some interior scenes and some exterior scenes, uh, just depending on how ambitious you are. So in one scene, we have this seat carriage on one of these periactoids where all of the squares, all of the upper class people are sitting in what are essentially bleachers and spectating, right? And then that periactoid revolves and we go back to that clubhouse for um, all of the lower class people 
that crybaby sort of layer, if you will. So having these rotating periactoids can save space and um, I see a lot of high school theaters utilizing rotating scenery um, because you just put casters on the bottom of these down here and you get multiple scenes for the price of one. So going into my set design for Much Ado About Nothing that I worked on with Kurt, uh, I talked about this a little bit when I introduced the whole concept of this play portfolio project. Just a few reminders. Uh, Kurt was from California. I love wine, so I wanted to set it in Napa Valley. I went to go see a play in Louisville, and they were using the sort of country western theme that I liked, but I kind of wanted to mix that not to just plagiarize from their play and steal their whole concept, but mix the West sort of specifically, not just a Western, but a California uh, romance set at a vineyard. Always loved vineyards. So for the set that we talked about with Kurt, we had kind of a two level here, like I showed you in my ground plan with a door and a window. Now, a uh, funny story, the, the stairs had to be very, very steep uh, because we don't have much room backstage. So we didn't actually use this upstairs that often um, because it was a very steep staircase and, and, and. Uh, so that over here we have our pergola that I, this is before everything got painted and set dressing. You can see I kind of started with the vines there, but I put full set dressing for this to have sort of a fun garden feel to it. So as I create a collage for this, what were some of my inspirations? So um, I really love New Orleans. I really love um, this, this showboat here, these ornate um, uh, New Orleans has these ornate uh, balconies that are very classic architecture from the turn of the century. And so those were very inspirational for me in creating this second level that we would have sort of this, um, you know, if you go to Mardi Gras during, uh, if you go to New Orleans during Mardi Gras, you'll see lots of people up here catching beads at the top of their balconies. And the balconies are more utilized in that area. Um, and so I really liked that sort of detail work too. I liked the tea and the feel of the gardens and it feeling very whimsical and romantic and imagined, you know, in the first scene when the soldiers come home, they're all sitting in kind of this garden having tea. Uh, so there's sort of a civilized upper class quality to my much ado about nothing rather than the Western of sort of saloons that we would think of because uh, when we look at um, Hero and her father, they're wealthy. He's a governor, right? So we want to make sure that to reflect that socioeconomically, that they're not just sitting around drinking beers in a bar. They are at a tea party because they're upper class citizens. That was my vision for the story that they're telling. Um, so here are my models. You can see I have a hot glued together matchsticks and wood chips. Uh, so it's very crude and rudimentary. Uh, this functional model, what's also called a white model, you can see here is very simple and plain. I have a little person there for size, a little cowboy. But then we get into the production model. I've glued some uh, little um, things I just found at a craft store that are actually supposed to go. They're kind of like glittery. You can't really tell in the picture. But that's supposed to represent all of the foliage that we ended up putting around the house to increase the garden feel and the set feel. You can see I kind of created a uh, quick sketch of what Kurt did beautifully here with a detailed background. For this one, we just had the one drop. We didn't have a psych or a multiple drops coming in. It was a relatively simple set which is part of the reason I'm using it as it for an example, because remember I said for you, you can just create like this one unit set 
and you can see how janky my little chair is. I apologize for that. Once again, these are just hot glued together wood chips. But once again, this isn't just a dollhouse to play with. This is a tool for me to say, okay, how many actors can I fit around this table based on these dimensions? Because everything's built to scale, right? This helps me. Um, I've measured out, okay, what are the standard platforms that I have in Powers Auditorium, that's how big I made, for example, this pergola is based on the platforms I already have. So it's a it's a tool and my son <laughs> loves to grab this black model um, base that I've had, oh, what, nine years now. I made it when I started Alice in Wonderland. You can see it's been painted and repainted, hot glued and re-glued. Um, but it, once again, I... I say this as a way of apology, but also just to clarify for you to have grace with yourself. It's a tool. Um, now, if you can have cleaner lines, if you can have, um, if you want to make yours out of paper instead of wood, part of the reason that I use wood is because I use the same furniture pieces, these same um, little model pieces over and over again. So I want it to be durable. But maybe for you, you're just looking for superficially to make them out of paper to take a picture and then wad it up and throw it in the trash can, right? Um, then you can probably make cleaner lines. You can probably um, do artistically something more engaging. Um, you can see I add a little set dressing here. I've got some fabric in the window. So uh, all of that to help tell the story to the actors, the costume designer, um, you know, just working in a team like this. And once again, this scale model is T tiny, right? This is, this is just the size of a paper here that I have as the base. So um, your functional model and production model will also be T tiny. Um, I do ask that you build out uh, the full box and the proscenium arch just to help us see the scale of everything. So it can be black, it doesn't have to be brown like mine is, but you can use that ground plan to help say, okay, here's where the stairs go, here's the lip of the stage, uh, here's the ramp. You do not have to build the ramp out. Once again, I built the ramp out because I'm staging and I'm putting little buttons here when I direct to help me see how many people I can fit on that ramp, <laughs> for example, but you do not, you're not required to do that just ask that you at least include the apron. You can choose to not even include the ramp if you want to. This is sort of a problem area, our narrator's corner. Um, part of what the reason that our narrator's corner becomes a problem is lighting, right? We only have a certain number of lights that we can use to light this corner. So you can see in some years I have built uh, a lot of scenery on this wall. Uh, for Madagascar, I put a beautiful waterfall on this wall with a special lighting effect, but it's always a trade-off for us and how much lighting we have. So if there's a lot of special effects that I want to use for light for that show, then I can't do a lot in the narrator's corner because I only have so much instrumentation for my lights. So you can utilize the narrator's corner or you can choose not to. Definitely, if you're showing this to an outside audience, they might not even understand the concept of what that little guy over there is. So don't feel pressured to include it. All I've got down there is a couch for this show. Um, I wanted the, the layer to feel dark and looming. So of course, only these villains sitting on the couch are lit and otherwise it's a dark corner. And that helps tell the story of them and the mood of what they're doing. There's Trevor. He played a drunk. It was hilarious. I miss Trevor. So for our latest show, which we have not realized, uh, Little Shop of Horrors, we have these sort of muses that are on stage for a lot of the show. Um, and they are often watching the story and then they'll come in and sing about what's going on and warn Seymour that he's going down the wrong path. Uh, they start the whole show. They're sort of this integral on stage all the time. I stuck them in the narrator's corner because once again, they're my narrators. They're the ones helping to tell the story in full swing. So why does this look so junky? Because the narrators are poor, right? They're singing about being downtown on Skid Row. And so they're 
kind of living in a junky environment, right? Got that lamp post. We got the American flag here as a sort of indictment, the greed of America. Pour some tea there for our audience. But you can see how that apron, um, you can actually see in this video, I mean, in this picture, the line of where they built it out. That was the original apron right there. And you can see we've added a good two feet there um, to the lip of the stage. And I don't regret it. I really like our ramp and our lip, but it does make it a little bit tricky. These are not part of the set design. These are sound panels to help absorb the sound. And these are just pretty. These little guys right here. These are also sound panels. The walls used to be carpeted, which made it like screaming into a pillow. Uh, the acoustics were horrible. It was overly padded. So these sound panels were part of making that right. But I digress. So how much set dressing do you need to include on your model? Um, that's up to you. I do ask that it be painted, right? That fully realized model. You can see I was trying, by adding those glittery little dots, I was trying to elucidate this wisteria, which I ended up putting all over on the set. But you're not necessarily required to do that as long as it's painted. We good. So one of the major things that you need to think about when you're designing a set is sight lines. This is one of my last concepts we'll talk about today, sight lines. So where is the audience sitting and can the audience see? So you can see in my original ground plan that I used this whole area of the stage right here for the back half of the, so we say like, you know, the front of the building is here and then back here is presumably where the house is. I haven't bothered to put a lot of detail in this area um, in the, uh, because that's where the um, audience can't see. Right now, maybe if you're sitting right here, you can see it, but if you're sitting way back here, you can't see it. So really the areas that you have to work with are the lip of the stage in Powers Auditorium, and then the center line, you can kind of work outside in the front here, but if you start getting into back here or back there, don't bother decorating it much. Don't bother putting much there because the audience can't see it. So the usable space you have is is even smaller than this. It's more like a triangle here on Powers Auditorium. Now that doesn't mean that an actor can never step out of sight lane. That doesn't mean that there can ever be scenery out of sight line because right for this guy over here, he can see back there where you want it decorated. But don't put anything integral to the story because this guy is going to miss it if it's going on right there. This is a pretty rudimentary uh, concept and one that you're probably already familiar with as an actor. But as a set designer, you really have to think about okay, I need, for example, in my ground plan, we've got a chair sitting almost center stage around that tea party. Well, that's where Hero sits because she's about to process some major news and start her love story. So, um, you know, I need that window that I created that I think is pretty central to the story is right about here where everybody can see it and think about it because from the moment that window is introduced in the last third of the play, it tells the story. So I need for them to be able to see it. I need for it to be, um, you know, we've got our wedding going on uh, right about here because it's a huge moment in the play. Our villains are close to the audience as they're telling this secretive tale in the narrator's corner. Uh, and so they're sort of in telling us this secret, so I wanted them to be really close to your audience. So you can see this is a, albeit grainy, picture of Powers Auditorium. We have a nice wide auditorium house and a deep theater stage. So this guy right here, um, or even worse, this guy back here in this corner, really can't see anything that happens upstage right, right? So you really, because it's got this nice big audience, you, you gotta be careful about where the action happens. And if 
I put, for example, I decide to add a five foot plant right here in front. Especially if I'm doing a children's show, that means nobody can see any of the action happening in the narrator's corner. So I don't ever put anything downstage in Powers Auditorium that's higher than my kneecaps because otherwise I have huge sightline issues. So that's the bad news. But anyway, lots of resources in the shell, um, lots of resources in your book. Feel free to get as ambitious with it as you want. Um, but just know that I'm looking for rudimentary arrangement of platforms, furniture, um, don't have to itemize every prop. You don't have to tell me um, every single detail of the set. I just, for this intro level class, want a rough sketch of your imaginings of the set. And feel free to get weird with it, right? That's part of the reason I picked a Shakespeare. It can be as abstract as you like. So hopefully your assignment is clear. Go forth and create, my designers, mwahahaha, create. As always, thank you for listening.